What is Expovio or Selenexor? So Selenexor is a very exciting new drug. Um, it's a first-in-class agent, which means it's a novel mechanism of action. We don't have any other drugs in this category. And what's really interesting about this is it's not just myeloma. And the reason I think it was published in the New England Journal is there are other tumors that are also uh, being studied, including lymphoma, sarcoma, endometrial cancer. How does Selenexor work? Cancer cells have a shuttle protein that moves proteins from the brains of the cell, the nucleus, into the cytoplasm, and oncoproteins. And so these are proteins that help the cell grow, and these are also blocked from being going, moving into the, the, from the brain into the cytoplasm. And the third protein is the glucocorticoid receptor. Everybody's favorite drug, steroids, is actually moved from the brains of the cell into the cytoplasm, and by blocking that, you, all of the, these three protein categories that are retained in the nucleus results in the cell death. And so I think what's exciting about this is it's amazing that it's working in myeloma, but the fact that it applies to other tumors tells us this is a general cancer mechanism, right? So many cancer cells are utilizing this mechanism to prevent cell death and avoid, resist, and avoid chemotherapy um, killing. What is the current indication of Selenexor? So the current indication for Selenexor, also known as Expovio, is basically heavily treated patients. So in this study that was done, known as the STORM, um, the, the indication is essentially the same as the study uh, eligibility criteria. So patients had to be what was considered penta-exposed for that study, um, which means the two proteasome inhibitors, bortezomib, carfilzomib, the two imids, lenalidomide and pomalidomide, and the CD38 monoclonal antibody, which until recently was just DARA, but now we have another drug Isotuximab. But basically, patients not only had to be exposed to the drugs, but more importantly, and this is really what the label focuses on, is triple class refractory. So you've not responding to P proteasome inhibitors, not responding to imids, not responding to CD38. And so really, that's an unmet need. And I think that's important because most, random, most new drugs require large randomized phase three studies. This got what was considered an accelerated approval, which means it was on a single arm study. Every patient got the drug. There was no comparator arm. It was 122 patients who all met these criteria. And the fact that they had a response is what led the FTA to grant this accelerated approval for this particular indication because this is an unmet medical need in myeloma. Uh, when patients exhaust those the categories of drugs, what do we do? And so I think it's great that patients have another option. What is the dosing of Selenexor like? Is it used in combination with anything else? And is it an oral drug? The dosing of Selenexor is very important. We know from initial phase one study that was published in Blood by Chen in 2018, uh, the phase one studies, they escalate the dose of the drug to determine both safety and efficacy. And so what we found in that study was that you really don't get the activity of the drug till you get to 80 milligrams twice a week. So that's given on day one and three. So for example, a typical schedule might be Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, um, and then the DEX is added on those same days. Now, it's important to talk about the drug and dosing because of who these patients were. So in STORM, these are patients who typically had had seven prior chemotherapies over 6.6 .6 years. That's important because we talk a lot about risk, but you know that if you went through seven chemos in 6.6 .6 years, these are high-risk patients, right? Because if we think about a typical patient getting induction therapy, transplant, and maintenance, if that should be lasting four years, and here you have patients that have gone through seven different drugs in 6.6 .6 years, it tells you that these patients are high-risk, and over 50% did have high-risk features. And more importantly, or as important, when patients signed consent to the day that they got Selenexor, which was a median of 12 days, there's a 22% increase in the protein. These patients had explosive disease. So the reason I bring up those points is that I often tell patients, this is like you need to accelerate. You're trying to get across a ramp on a car. If you don't go fast and jump across, we're not going to make it over. And so when you have such heavily treated disease, and when you know this drug requires 80 milligrams twice weekly to dose, that is the approved dosing schedule for single uh, for uh, cell and extra with dexamethasone alone, so uh, single agent slash combination with dex regimen. And so because of that dosing and schedule, we were able to get a response rate um, about 26%, although um, I can, we can talk more that at Mount Sinai, that response rate was actually 56%. We used a very aggressive supportive care. And so the reason you need that dosing and schedule is that we need to get the disease under control. These are patients who many might end up have, having gone to hospice without disease control. Once we control the disease, then we can pull back because there are side effects that require management, but you can't, you can't control the disease 
if your patient's not still on the drug, right? So I think that's an important part. Now, there are very exciting other combination studies ongoing, um, and there's a study, there's a regimen, uh, there's a clinical trial called STOMP, where basically takes backbone regimens and adds selenexer, so bortezomib, uh, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, dara. And what's important when we do these combination studies is that the dose of selenexer changes when you do combination studies. And it's important to put this into context. We've had a lot of drug approvals. We, it makes, I think, 11 in two decades. And let's look at the other drugs that have been approved recently, carfilzomib, POM, and Dara. They had single agent approval. They had accelerated approval. But no one's using those drugs as doublets, right? Because in heavily treated patients, you need combination therapy. A response rate of 20 to 30 percent is just not enough. When you do combination strategies, you're getting response rates of 60 to 70 percent. And so when you do combination strategies with Cell and Xor, it really depends what the partner drug is. So if you're not using an IMID, the dosing schedule is typically 100 milligrams weekly. Uh, if you're using an IMID, it can typically lower at 60 milligrams. And the reason for that is because the IMIDs cause lo lower blood counts than the other drugs like proteasome inhibitors and CD38. So uh, 100 for non-IMIDs and 60 for IMID. Again, both are weekly. And the last point I would make on this dosing and schedule is we recently, just this week, had a press release from Cariofarm showing that the Boston study, which was bortezomib dex twice weekly compared to bortezomib dex with cell and exor, and this showed favorable results where the patients had a significantly longer progression-free survival with the addition of cell and exor compared to the control arm. And what's particularly interesting about this study is that in the control arm, bortezomib was, and dexamethasone were given twice weekly whereas in cell and exor arm it was given once weekly. So this is the very the first time this has ever been done because it's risky for a company to use less of the backbone drug. It means your drug has to work even harder because you're not using as much bortezomib and dex. So the fact that this regimen was efficacious shows that not only does cell and exor and dex work by itself in heavily treated patients, in less heavily treated patients, it can be combined and improve the clinical outcome. One of the important features of Selenexor is it's an oral regimen. Selenexor uh, with dexamethasone, obviously oral completely, and depending on what your partner drugs, if you're doing combination strategies, regimens like Selenexor, dex, and pomalidomide, which was presented at ASH by Christine Chen, uh, is a completely oral regimen. Uh, Selenexor, dex, and lenalidomide would also be oral. Um, this is great for patients who may be living far away from a cancer center, perhaps in a rural area, uh, I've been uh, in fascinated by how much interest there is at XUS. Uh, you know, patients in China live very, very far from infusion centers, so um, there's a big need for oral drugs, and I think um, when you have an active drug uh, that's oral, it's, it's great for patients. What are the unique side effects of Selenexor? How are they managed, and what are the long-term side effects? Side effects are always an important part of management of any drug, and Selenexor definitely has side effects like many, all of our other oncologic products. Uh, and when we first started doing Selenexor treatments, our patients also had a hard time. But we had the ability to learn from our experience because of the volume of patients. So at Mount Sinai, we treated a, a quarter of the population on STORM. And we have a manuscript that's now um, shortly going to be published where we looked at our outcomes compared to the overall population. So our response rate was over 50% compared to 26%. Our progression-free survival was 5.3 months instead of 3.5 months. And our overall survival was over 15 months compared to 8.6 months. So how did that happen? Well, we learned from our initial experience that this drug does have GI side effects. And so I would say the main side effects of Selenex or the categories I would put them are gastrointestinal, hematologic, fatigue, and sodium. And so what did we do for each of those categories? For GI, we realized that a lot of patients had nausea. Not as much vomiting, but more nausea. And we think the reason for that is this drug does penetrate the blood-brain barrier, and there's a, what we call an emetogenic center, which is the area of the brain that can cause nausea. This drug may be activating that. So how do we block that? We decided to use an aggressive cocktail, um, and we used uh, Ondansetron or Zofran uh, every eight hours, especially because the drug has a short half-life. You don't have to give it forever. Because it's a day one and three schedule or once weekly in combination, give it for those initial few days that the patient's on, so on Dancetron or Zofran. We also gave a drug called uh, an, an NK1 receptor antagonist, like Rolapitin or Verubi, every two weeks. There are other NK receptor antagonists. Um, the reason we decided on this one is those other drugs, like a Prepitin or Amend, uh, can actually activate or potentiate steroids. So if you're going to give that drug, you actually have to reduce the dexamethasone.
So um, if people can get that drug and that's the only one, fine, just lower the dex. And then the third drug that we used is olanzapine uh, or Zyprexa. All of these drugs are on label for nausea. Some people get scared because olanzapine is officially also an antipsychotic drug, but it is on label, it's studied, and it's been approved by the FDA for nausea. So we start with this aggressive cocktail, and then once we've gotten off that ramp um, and the, the patient's had a disease response and now we're able to control it, um, there's sometimes other issues that come up that require a reduction of the dose anyway, then we start pulling back, right? So I think in oncology, the adage is supportive care should start from day one, right? We shouldn't let patients suffer and then try to address it and catch up. It's much better for everyone, patient first and foremost, to start with the aggressive preventative strategies and then once they're tolerating it, well, you can eliminate things that are, may not be needed. The second thing that we, for the fatigue, it's just to address the other side effects uh, or the other causes of fatigue. So this could include uh, anemia, it could include um, thyroid function, adrenal insufficiency, uh, dehydration, which can be treated with fluid. So you have to address the underlying cause. For those patients where we couldn't find anything else and we had reduced the drug, and that's an important part of side effect management, because when we talk about drugs, uh, we, we use a parameter called half-life, which is when you take the drug, how long does it take to clear the body? This has a relatively short half-life of four to six hours. And what we know in medicine is that it takes four half-lives to leave the body. So pretty much if you take the pill, within a day, it's gonna be gone. So you can always reduce the drug when you re-challenge with the next week if the side effect is not manageable. So we talked about GI, we talked about fatigue. For sodium, it's often from not having enough food intake or salt intake. So we would give typically fluids and or um, if not responding to that, we would sometimes give salt tabs. And then the last one is hematology. In some ways, this is the easiest for our community and uh, academic hematologist oncologists to manage because if you're a hematologist oncologist, you know how to manage blood counts, especially for a bone marrow cancer like myeloma. And so it's important to talk about this because um, Salinex or, you know, whenever we talk about a side effect of the drug, it's important to know that the side effect cannot be extricated from patient factors and disease factors. So by that I mean the rates of severe thrombocytopenia, for example, or low platelets are much higher in myeloma than we see in other tumors like lymphoma and liposarcoma because those diseases don't have as much marrow replacement, right? So myeloma patients typically have been beaten up more by their this time of their disease course, their bone marrow may have more myeloma and they're gonna have lower blood counts. So one of the ways to deal with the blood counts, obviously with white count, we give growth factors like Nupagen or um, Filgrastim is a generic, Nupagen brand, Zarzio, uh, we can hold the drug again. Uh, for red cells, often we transfuse. Uh, for platelets, um, we actually used in, uh, in this manuscript that uh, is coming out shortly, there are drugs that stimulate platelet production like uh, Romiplastin or N-plate which can be given when the platelets are dropping. If you have to hold Salinexor, you can give these drugs to boost up the platelets and then resume the treatment. So um, I, I would say that in general, um, our experience showed that side effect management is really important. Um, when we looked at the overall number of patients in STORM coming off for adverse events versus progression, at Mount Sinai, it was only two patients, which is 7% compared to 33%. And so I think this is proof of the pudding. Why did our patients have better response rate, better PFS, better overall survival? It's because less patients came off for side effects. We were able to keep them on therapy so they could derive benefit. And the final point I would make in side effect management, a lot of this is counseling. When you're telling a patient for the first time about Silonex or you say, look, this is a drug that works. It's been FDA approved as a single agent. Now also we have evidence in combination. It's completely novel mechanism of action, but there are side effects. Our plan to do, deal with this is really be aggressive about supportive care. We're gonna start you on a cocktail of medications, and if we don't need it, we will pull back. Um, and if certainly if you need more, we will do that. But I think if you tell patients that this is not an easy drug for everyone, um, but the side effect managements are effective and it's an effective drug, I think that really changes people's willingness to do these things. And um, also emphasizing that it, if, if there is a side effect, we can always hold the drug and the side effects resolve quickly. And I think that's shown by the fact that in our patient population, even though the PF progression free sur survival was 5.3 months, people live 15 months, over 15 months. And the reason for that is if and when they start progressing, there's no severe side effects that, that, that prevent you from going on to yet another clinical trial, right? In advanced myeloma, this is like a Tarzan situation. You need to grab onto a vine so that you can then get to your next vine. And that's what this little drug allows you to do uh, because of the aggressive side effect management.
So in terms of long-term side effects, we talked about the, the uh, <clears throat> gastrointestinal fatigue, hematology, and sodium. Notice what we didn't talk about. We didn't talk about cardiac, renal, pulmonary. Really, those are the things that are going to potentially prevent these patients from going on to other treatments or studies. And so the fact that we don't have any of those non-heme toxicities, the fact that the drug has such a short half-life, I think speaks to the ability of this drug to do its thing, and if and when you need to move on, the patients are ready to go on to their next therapy. How can Selenexor help relapsing CAR-T patients? So we talked about the use and current indication for Selenexor, but one of the other most unmet medical needs with in myeloma right now is in patients who undergo CAR-T, what do we do with those patients if and when they don't continue in remission? And that's a very tough population to treat because they can end up with sometimes low blood counts, extramedullary disease, and perhaps most importantly, when we prepare patients for CAR-T, they get a treatment called fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. And these drugs are very potent immune-killing drugs. So they can knock out a patient's T cells, which is a part of the immune, micro, uh, immune perhaps the most important part of the immune system. Um, and these are the same cells that are responsible for activity in the bispecific drugs, right? So we have these whole new classes of drugs called T cell engagers or bispecifics, where they have half of the drug binding to the T cell, the other half to the myeloma. And by bringing the T cells close proximity, they kill the myeloma. The problem with these CAR T patients is not only have by definition, if they're progressing on CAR-T, that CAR is not working anymore. And they may not have any T cells from the fludarabine. And so we recently just published a manuscript in British Journal of Hematology just this week in March of 2020 um, that showed activity of selenexor based regimens. We had seven patients who had selenexor either with dexamethasone, bortezomib, or carfilzomib that all had responses. And what was striking is some of these patients had responses that were, were deeper and more durable than during the CAR. So I think that's a really great option because going forward, our next unmet medical need in myeloma will probably be post-BCMA failures, right? So BCMA is that protein that's being targeted in many ways by uh, CAR-Ts, by bispecifics, by the antibody drug conjugate known as belantamab from GSK. And so while these drugs are working, what do you do when that stops working? So it's another great option for patients, and again, completely oral. Um, so it'll be, uh, I think it's another option for patients. And I think uh, I'm also very excited about the science being done. Um, can we identify who will benefit from Solinex or who might be resistant? And at Mount Sinai, we're doing some very exciting work, potentially finding some biomarkers that might predict for resistance. So meaning, if somebody has a particularly uh, high expression of a protein such as MAGE that may predict for lack of response, perhaps those are the patients that need combination therapy.